Hello, and welcome to the arbitration conversation. In this conversation, we're going to talk to one of the leaders in international and in arbitration and cyber arb, um, Sophie Nappert. Sophie Nappert is also listed in the top 30 female arbitrators worldwide by Global Arbitration Review, which is huge. Um, she's also completed programs on blockchain strategy and has worked in the area of blockchain, which is another area near and dear to my heart. Um, I've heard about Sophie from many different people. There's so many people who say, you've got to interview Sophie. So finally, I'm getting a chance to interview her. So Sophie, thank you so much for coming. It's a great pleasure. Thank you for having me. So first of all, I guess I would love to hear, because this is really part two, focusing on cyber art. How yes. did you and Wendy ever become interested in start cyber art? Okay, so it, this is first of all, Wendy's baby. Uh, I'm, I'm very much a godmother um, to provide a sounding board for her to really bring this to fruition, which she has to great, great success. She is an absolute dynamo. Uh, and probably I, to my, for my money anyway, uh, she embodies the best that uh, the younger generation in this space have to offer. She is smart, she is enthusiastic, she is knowledgeable. I mean, she works for a tech company and she essentially, uh, we met at a, um, a conference in Belgium where I was giving a keynote address on uh, the future of arbitration. And she, uh, we kept in touch. And then um, as it happened, she uh, approached me because she had just after the um, ICA report on cybersecurity and New York Bar, I think it was a joint effort, uh, New York City Bar uh, put together this report on cybersecurity came out, which was the first, I think, um, dialogue, I would say on these issues. She said to me, she said, look, I think this is fantastic, but I'm reading it. I don't understand a word of it. Uh, and if I were not myself in the tech space, I wouldn't know how to, you know, make sure that I'm not a weak link in the cyber uh, space. And I said, actually, I agree. Uh, I think, you know, because this was a first endeavor and there was a group of people, obviously, you have to ha find wording that everyone's happy with. But you, in terms of really practical, um, you know, if you are an arbitrator, especially if you're not with a big firm, so the first, what do I do? What's the first thing I should do apart from not having a Gmail address? And why shouldn't be have, should I be having a Gmail address? You know, some of us ask themselves that question. So I said, I said, I think there is space there for a really sort of basic uh, walk around the garden, step by step. Uh, approach and and that's what she that's what cyber arb is uh, so what um, cyber arb became uh, started as a post on clue arbitration blog explaining the challenge of that praising it, the ICA report and saying well this we're proposing step two and then uh, it gathered quite a lot of interest uh, fellow enthusiasts and now there is a small team of us at cyber arb who, whose job it is to raise awareness uh, so there's a lot, I'm sure Wendy explained, a lot of um, training, a lot of education and knowledge building. Uh, but also now um, there is um, quite a lot of enthusiasm to put out templates like uh, procedural orders, like checklists uh, and, and very basic uh, steps that any arbitrator or any party uh, who is not, doesn't have a huge firm's resources behind them uh, can take. And um, I, I, I think the, the idea is to be very accessible and, and very simple. And so I applaud that. I think that's uh, more, than, more than welcome because I mean, when these numbers are, are, are striking, I think, I don't know how many um, attacks a day on law firms and, and legal businesses. And I think arbitrators are very much uh, vulnerable. So that's what it is. Well, and it's such an important issue, especially as you note, you know, maybe if you're in a larger law firm where you spend a lot of time or maybe even have the resources, of course, to hire a special company or whatever else. But if you're, you know, a smaller firm or if you're an arbitrator working alone, you might not really have sort of a step by step of how do you really protect yourself. 
Um, to that vein, what do you see as kind of the vision and goals? You talked about perhaps putting out checklists um, or maybe protocols. Are there other ideas that are coming down the pike in terms of the vision and goals for CyberArb? So cyber, we're, cyber arb is taking it one step at a time, but there, there is at the moment a lot of feelers that are being uh, sent out to people like Colin Rule, who is actually the person who put us uh, on uh, together actually uh, for, for, this, for this interview, uh, people who are interested in online dispute resolution, uh, somewhat, uh, a, a, um, a platform like Delos. So Delos is a fledging arbitration institution in their own right, and they have a great interest in um, uh, cybersecurity and technology generally. And so they want to make sure that their users are completely uh, on board with all of this and very familiar with it. And the challenge, of course, is to get, is to get the, I would say, perhaps the, the generation of established arbitrators, to use a polite term, to listen. Because many uh, just say, well, I don't, you know, I have my assistant dealing with this, uh, but that may not be enough. And the assistant may know what they know, but they may not be an IT specialist. And so in order, I think, to get them to listen, um, one of the arguments that um, I think CyberArb is going to put on the table, and I think it's a real one, is to say that uh, in this current um, environment of um, databases of arbitrator and feedback on arbitrator's performance, it is already, I think, a fact and will become even more of a fact that those databases and feedback will include, you know, how uh, familiar or how at ease is the arbitrator with cybersecurity measures? Have they raised it at the first case management conference? What did they put in their procedural order? Did they look like they were on top of this? And if you don't get very good feedback on this score going forward, I think your chances of reappointment are not great uh, because there are people, there will be people uh, among the arbitrator pool who will be familiar and who will be on top of this stuff. So I think, I think that's the idea down the pipeline. We are, I mean, this is an endeavor that is still embryonic and we are taking it one step at a time very practical very you know sort of um, meeting the need uh, and so the need is to get people to listen and to take those steps and to actually not only not only take them but be seen to take them oh yeah i think that's just fabulous i mean it's just it makes me <laughs> i agree 100 percent. and i think about i had thought about or even 15 years ago projecting that it would be um the main way that we arbitrate given the efficiencies and cost savings. And that's the future. And you have to be able to protect, protect data, protect privacy, and certainly having those kinds of um, protocols in place and understanding them. Um, I think what CyberArb is doing is really important. Um, okay. I could envision, are you doing, um, have you already started doing trainings, for example? Yes. So Absolutely. So we uh, have been very lucky. Uh, and Wendy, as I told you, is fantastic at uh, gathering enthusiasm from everywhere. But we've been uh, we've had fantastic support from arbitrator intelligence ambassadors, for example. So we have presented to them. There is um, a weekly endeavor that was started by three young female lawyers uh, called Mute of Thursdays, which is a TED Talk style uh, presentation, very short, four to five minutes, every Thursday afternoon. That started during the first lockdown. And a younger generation uh, of a uh, version of that has now started called Young Mew Talk. And we presented to them as well. Uh, and I know that since then, there has been a lot of people lining up uh, for whom, you know, there was an interest in hearing what Wendy had to say and having this, so the first, the first series of talk was more about what the project is and what we were thinking, what was the idea and, and to gather some feedback on that, whether that was really meeting a need and the response has been phenomenal. That's when Wendy decided to take, to have some help because <laughs> she couldn't do her day job after, after those few presentations. And now I think the second round of, um, of um, knowledge building or, um, or training uh, is going to involve uh, precisely what I was saying. So introducing people to the more practical tools uh, that we are going to put out. 
Yeah, and even from an ethics standpoint, as an ethical arbitrator, you need to think about cybersecurity. So there's a lot of good reason to pay attention to these issues. I mean, it's it can be delicate because you know I have um, I have cases with um, state entities, for example, on one on, on one side, usually uh, respondents, and it's quite surprising to me how in certain parts of the world. Um, ministers or people quite high up in certain ministries use their private addresses, be it Gmail, Yahoo, or anything else, um, to hear about the case. I don't know if maybe they don't or they their policy says you shouldn't be using government email for this mm -hmm. matter. So they use their Gmail address. So as an arbitrator, when you spot that at the beginning, uh, you have to flag it. And it's not always, uh, it's a little bit sensitive to say to a minister, well, uh, you know, is your Gmail address secure? Uh, and, and how do you know that it is? Um, and so it's very, very basic steps like that, that you need to be aware of and, and to raise in the most diplomatic way possible, but making sure that that person is not the weak link. Because obviously, yeah. as you say, uh, Amy, and you're absolutely right, it is the future, but what does that that does mean is that more and more data is going to be more and more accessible online and therefore vulnerable uh, to attack. Well, and it also brings up the importance of using separate platforms, right? Because if you're not using your Gmail, but you're instead exchanging documents, keeping things secure on a secure platform, that of course will absolutely help out in guarding that information. Absolutely, yeah, definitely. Yeah, no, that's a big one. And then I also wanted to ask you about blockchain. Um, where do you see blockchain fitting into um, privacy, protecting privacy in arbitration? Goodness me. So, uh, well, that's quite a leap. <laughs> oh. um, <laughs> blockchain, um, right. I, I, uh, hmm. It's a difficult question um, because it it rather depends on the public or private nature of the blockchain, as mm -hmm. you know. Uh, I, at the moment, um, I would say, uh, according to my state of knowledge, and I'm no techie, but to my state of knowledge of uh, the public um, blockchain um, and public uh, free access, not permissioned, uh, I don't see um, data as being um, that secure because I think that um, although the cryptography is quite advanced, it is hackable. It is absolutely mm -hmm. hackable. And, uh, and those, those who are minded to do it are getting more and more sophisticated. Mm -hmm. So I would say for arbitration, uh, we are, and given the very um, sensitive nature of for, for users anyway, what they consider as very sensitive, uh, be it trade secrets or commercial information or, or data, um, I think the uh, public blockchain is not the answer, and, and it's not something that's going to give them comfort. Something that's private permission, but that's almost, almost like an internet, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that that is to me a, a real accessible, uh, currently available solution. It's not. It doesn't fulfill the blockchain utopia uh, yet, but um, you know, it is relatively early days for the use of blockchain in such a mainstream context. But there's definitely, definitely, I mean, I'm not an evangelist about blockchain, but I really want, I'm one, unlike other other, other of my colleagues, uh, like Paul Cohen, for example, with, uh, who's a co-author uh, on this topic, who does just doesn't believe that it's going anywhere. I think it is going somewhere. And I think that it is a promise for the future, but it needs, I think it needs to deliver uh, a, a product that with which I think commercial entities and government is more comfortable. Uh, yeah. I think it has to be also a little bit less uh, wedded to crypto because at the moment, I think the marriage with crypto mm -hmm. hurts its credibility on a more mainstream platform. Uh, there's also that aspect of it. Yeah, no, I agree with you. And um, I think that was a perfect answer to that question because it's a tough one and everyone thinks, oh, is it the answer? <coughs> Not necessarily, but there are some, there's promise there. There is promise, I agree. So, well, thank you so much for taking time with us today. I really appreciate it. Um, it's real honor to have you on the arbitration conversation. It's a great pleasure and thank you again and stay safe.